Welcome to the Galileo podcast with myself and you for the Christmas special 2023. I'm going to put in more jingle bells. Um, Galileo podcast is the podcast for your early stage tech news and views from two pre-seed VCs, namely us. And in this episode, we are going to cover AI agents, our favorite moments of 2023 predictions for 2024. We are going to taste test some cocktails created by ChatGPT. I have my ingredients here. Oh, I, my ingredients are all strewn all over my desk, so. <laughs> and we're going to roast a deck. And we're all going to do this really quickly. So how does that sound here? I just, I love a speed run. So let's get going. Fantastic. But first, before we jump into this, as some of our fans may have seen, uh, and I expect a lot of our fans... Our raging in podcast that, fans, yeah. Uh, yeah, the top 1% podcasters uh, yeah. in, in You know who Spotify you are, wrapped. top 1% Spotify wrapped Galileo <laughs> podcast right. listeners. Correct. As they may have seen, last week, Relevance AI announced their US $10 million round led by King River Capital alongside Peak15, formerly Sequoia, and Insight Partners. It is the largest round so far in our portfolio. It's also one of the largest rounds for AI agents. And so we're super excited by that. It was co-founded by Daniel Vasilev and Jackie Ko. And essentially, if you don't know Relevance AI, they're building a low-code platform that lets companies build and deploy custom AI agents to automate uh, repetitive tasks. You know, things like, for example, booking in a sales meeting with your SDR reps or answering basic customer support queries, things like that. Now, this is all part of what they're calling the AI workforce, which is super exciting. And Daniel has an op-ed piece, which I'll link in the show notes as well, which I highly recommend you read if you're interested in agents. But the cool thing for us is that we invested back in 2020 before AI was cool, I like to say. Now, according to Daniel, they believe that every team will have hired an AI agent by 2025. And by 2030, you'll have full-fledged AI teams supporting you in your everyday business, which is a pretty grand vision and a pretty interesting one. Um, as I mentioned, it's noteworthy for us because it's one of our biggest rounds. We've had some really fantastic investors join this round from around the world. So it's not just in the US, but also Australia and Asia. And we've been on the journey since day one. So I wanted to take a quick second to just ask ourselves a couple of questions about this investment. What, you know, what other founders can sort of um, gleam from this, I guess. And to be sure, this is a investment that's ongoing, right? They're only in Series A, so they're still very early. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, Hugh, was there's a lot of talk around AI safety, job loss, AI doomerism taking over the world. Everyone who listens to podcasts know we don't quite agree. But as a VC, how do you think about this in the context of relevance? Look, I mean... I think I think a lot of the conversations about safety and job loss and everything else, like it goes back to every new piece of tech uh, where, you know, everyone's drawn up those old articles from like, you know, the 80s and things about how, you know, calculators are going to make everyone unemployed and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I think a lot of that just isn't, you know, n never comes out in reality. Um, I think with this investment, it's really the piece of like, how do you make your people more efficient? And if you look at the timing and, and coming back to the piece of the macroeconomic climate, like, I think that question of how do I make my team and people more efficient and my everyday work life more efficient, that's where we're going to see the early applications of AI. Um, some people might say that's, uh, you know, job loss or whatever. And I would say, well, were they really high value, you know, sort of, I guess, high accretive value jobs in the first place? Or were they the sort of jobs where, you know, you sort of had people because the technology wasn't there to be able to do it, you know, like... I don't know, like the days of where you would have people post in forms to you because web forms were too hard. Um, does the fact that web forms exist now, you know, strip out the many people who used to just copy type stuff into databases? Well, you know, I think there's positive steps forward for efficiency as well as the rest of society that really we need to think about. Um, so I'm not too concerned, I guess, about that in the context of this investment. I think in some ways this investment uh, lines up with that macroeconomic environment of really like, hey, everyone's going to be looking towards what happens next and how do we actually generate efficiency in our businesses. Cool. Thank you. So it's just a point. And I agree. Um, uh, and question for you, James. Like, yeah. there are a lot of these sort of generative AI, Gen AI, as they're now known, Gen AI startups um, getting funded. Like, what makes Relevance so compelling? What I think is really interesting is that the Relevance team started off um, in vector databases uh, and finding out relevant features in unstructured data. And that was their pedigree. 
this is before LLMs became really popular, and this is before we even had the term AI agents, which is you know really interesting to think about. You know, in terms of a market thesis, like this market didn't exist. Now it does. Um, and so seeing that play out, like being on that bleeding edge of the whole like revolution of a tech platform is like super fascinating to me because it's probably the one of the first times that we're really at that bleeding edge within our portfolio as it happens globally. And so just seeing the team and their internal experiments and what they're doing is just, it's just totally fascinating and, and a little bit mind blowing in a lot of ways. So I think what I think is very compelling is that they're combining what they did in vector databases with ML techniques and language models, you know, whether that's OpenAI or other language models as well, like Anthropic, in an interface that allows any human expert to create an AI custom workflow flow that we're now calling agents is like super fascinating. And so while there's other startups that are doing bits of this, and there are other startups tackling this within verticals, like, you know, customer support service agent or sales agent, the reality is with AI, you don't actually need to be verticalized because it's actually in some, in some ways better not to be. And I think that's very cool that Relevance is trying to do this across industries and trying to be the platform that you do this for, um, for organizations around the world. And so I think in that respect, it's a very lofty mission. Um, it's a very big vision. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, I'm sure. Um, but it's like amazing to see that play out. And, and as a result, you know, where I'm going to share some of the elegance that we're making internally for Galileo. And um, there's going to be some really interesting use cases coming through. And in fact, we've just published a blog post on this. Well, that I wrote that's a bit long, admittedly, but it's a good holiday read. Great. Love a holiday <laughs> I, read. I know what you'll be reading first day of your holiday here. Of course, naturally. <laughs> James's diatribe on AI agents. But for those listening, if you are interested, you know, we'll link in the show notes. And, and I, I just sort of go through a bunch of examples of AI agents. And so Relevance is really just one of, of quite a few cohorts of companies. But, you know, in terms of how much money they've now raised, they're really in the top few globally that have raised this money for this product category, which is now emerging. So I think that's super exciting. Yeah, I agree. Moving on to our next section, we have the lovely Ludi from Team Galileo joining us. Welcome, Ludi. Hey, guys. Good to be back. Fantastic. Very good to have you. <laughs> Now, for this section, rather than go through news, because it's the Christmas special, I'm going to add like Christmas bells. Oh, to wait this. a minute. I meant to like. Yeah, where's your Christmas hat? Oh, there we go. Oh. Yeah, Christmas special. Lovely. <laughs> Great. Santa Hugh bringing it looks all the funding gifts. It looks better on this side. <laughs> Those just listening, Hugh just put on a Santa cap. <laughs> Rather than do news, in this section, we are going to go through the team's favorite moments of 2023. So I'm going to go around the room, the Zoom room, and I just want mm -hmm. one moment and a lesson for founders or investors. And kicking it off, Ludi, what is your favorite moment of 2023? Oh, I think my favorite moment, of course, is launching the Jupiter program for Galileo. That was like an amazing time spent with the, the female founders that I got to work with. But on off the back of that, there was also a recent initiative that was launched called Grapevine. And so that's like grassroots led by startup founders, operators and leaders. And essentially like the aim is to raise awareness for um, abuse of power, harassment and bullying within like the tech industry. Um, and I think like being in the industry for such a long time, I think like eight years now, um, it's nice to sit, finally see something like this mm. sort of like come through into fruition. It's just an awesome initiative. So yeah, that's probably one of the my favorite moments. And towards the end of the year, that's a very that's a very good moment actually. Right? Well, we, was, we can was, put a link in the show notes. We'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, and what's the lesson for out of those favorites? What is the the one lesson mm. if there is one for founders and investors? This one's actually not quite related to it, but maybe it is. This one. Like I've also spoken about this in the Jupiter program, but about like being really particular about building a business and cutting burn when you need to, um, when you're thinking about like raising your next mm -hmm. fund, um, sorry, your next round and trying to extend that runway. Um, so, I mean, like growth at all, at all costs is like amazing, but also sometimes you just need to like reduce headcount salaries um, and forecast and like try to spend as efficiently as possible. That's a good message. Capital efficiency is always a good thing yeah. in our books. So thank you for that. Okay, on to Hugh. Hugh, what was your favorite moment? 
look, I found this really hard to select what my favorite moment is. Like, I was going to say, like, the implosion of the crypto market, you know, like, ha ha ha. But then at the same time, as, you know, even one of our investors, uh, even one of our LPs pointed out, you know, if you'd put, put money into Bitcoin at the start of the year and then now, you know, you're up 600% or something. Um, so, you know, as much mm -hmm. as I joke about the implosion, uh, and it's been nice, I guess, to have fewer Web3 pitches, terrible <laughs> Web3 pitches. Uh, we don't see quite as many as we did maybe in the heyday of last year. Um, I think in the same light, I think in some ways, the the moment, I don't know if this is, a, I'm going to call this a favorite moment to be a bit, bit contrarian, is like, I, I think this year startups became hard. I think in the last couple of mm. years, startups have been really easy and people have perceived startups to be really easy, both in a good way and a bad way. And this year they became hard. And I think we're, what we've really seen is we've seen the ways in which, um, like, which founders are the type of people who are doing it because it's like it is their life's work. It's really what they want to do. And mm. separately, the people who go, oh, actually, like, I kind of want to just cash check at a big bank. Um, and I think that's, you know, no shame in that at all, to be clear. Um, but I think it's made that, like, the sheen has come off startups as a sector. And I think it, you know, it's kind of like, it's showing that piece of what's real and what's not, um, which I think is a really positive sign in some ways because you have less of that sort of frothy, you know, money everywhere kind of market. Yeah, that's a um, good. That's a good one. It's a bit contrarian. Uh, what is the lesson yeah. though inside that? I mean, I think the lesson there is really just like, in some ways, I'd say the lesson is like, be be cautious about jumping on those trends. I mean, even the trend now is potentially going to be, you know, AI. Everyone, th everything's about AI. Um, and you know, two years ago, everything was about crypto, and now no one's asking about you know where Web three or crypto fits into this thing. So I think you've got to be careful about when you jump on those kind of trends. And you know, certainly we see a number of startups where they just sort of jump from one trend to the next trend to the next yeah. trend. Um, and yeah, sometimes do. they are a bit of a storm in a teacup, and they just sort of they they leave and they pass, and that's it. And you know, perhaps Metaverse is going to be that as well. Who knows? Um, but like, I think the lesson there is really like, you know, a little bit, a little bit coming back to Ludi is like, you, you've really got to make sure you're actually building a business here and, you know, you're actually doing something. Um, and if you just kind of do these kinds of businesses where you're just kind of continuously blowing smoke up each other's asses, it's just not very, it, it does, doesn't last very long. So I just have some great imagery and I just want to really jump on like, <laughs> thanks, Dali thanks. You can go, you can, yeah, I was going to say, you, you can go back to those like, you know, 18th century paintings of like, because yeah. that's where the saying comes from is like, you know, there was a, that was an old treatment, medical I world. actually did I actually didn't know that was where it came from. Is it old treatment? I, I believe where it came from. Oh, really? Okay. Well, <laughs> well maybe we'll, we'll link something in show notes. Similar vibe to, to you here. I'm going to be a little bit contrarian. Uh, I think, uh, and I'm going to just be a little bit cheeky. I've got two favorite moments. The first favorite moment is we hit 20 investments in our portfolio for Fund One. I'll put a, I'll put a little, you know, cheers, self-congratulatory <laughs> cap in there. Um, and I think that's a big milestone for us because we've now invested over this period, which has been wild because we've had COVID and now we've had the tech crash. So, uh, so I think we've got a very mixed portfolio of founders that have started in different parts and it's really fascinating mm -hmm. to see. Um, and it's also super exciting because now we have a big portfolio and obviously they're all doing really interesting things. Um, the broader moment for me though is the fact that I think we are now in a new era. And mm -hmm. so I think the 2012 to 2022 decade was obviously a big bull run for tech and fueled a little bit by SaaS, I would say, uh, software as a service, subscription, enterprise. I think from 2023 onwards, we're in a new era. I don't know what it is. Obviously, AI will play a piece, but I don't think it's going to be called AI. I, have a th I think it's going to be called something else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the lesson for founders uh, would be uh, the best time to start a business is when you have the idea and the inspiration and to just start. And what I mean by that is there is no good time. The best time is now. So I think regardless of market cycles, we still see and we still want to fund startups and founders. Um, and I would say that kind of like you, when the market is down, uh, you get more people that are, I guess, really, really think it's their life works. When capital is cheap, you obviously get a lot of hanger ongers and tourists. I'll call them tourists. You get a lot of tourists as well. And, and so, so that kind of like is really interesting to see. But nonetheless, if you're a founder, it doesn't really matter what the market is. There's always someone trying to start something new. And I think that's always exciting. So the lesson would be just right. do it. What is your prediction for 2024? 
what is your what are you looking forward to or what are you going to predict for 2024 Ludi, you go first oh i think this one is more like a fundraising thing that i'm seeing um and just like a drop in bridge round so i think 2023 was like full of extensions as investors like kind of gave additional cash to their current portfolios hoping that they're just like going to survive and get to the next round and i think now it's going to transition into like proper primary rounds and um and they're going to be less generous with their current portfolios and i mean Mm. i think we're already seeing that too when we see like bridge rounds come through we're like what's going on here um so it's more of like a cautionary thing for founders okay yeah yeah okay cool thanks lady my prediction for 2024 is just like everyone gets back to work like i feel like it's yeah this year has been this period of just like you know kind of weeded out the things where people are you know, like the, the company's too big it's gotten too big too quickly or like doesn't really have the right fundamentals everything else and I, and I feel like next year is where we'll really start seeing i think that combination of increase of you know cost of living and inflation everything else is going to kind of flow through to like let's just get back to doing the work um and, and this mm-hmm. year i think a lot of people have quite reasonably been quite uncertain in how they've made decisions. Um, you know, what, what, even from an employee perspective, you know, what company do they choose? You know, do they want to go for an early stage company or they want to go for a late stage company with a bit more certainty and things like that in an environment where there's more, you know, inflation and a bit more risk, I guess. Um, but I think next year is where it's sort of like people will have adjusted. Like this year, it sort of almost in some ways feels like it's been another COVID of like this yeah. big shock where everything suddenly like the zero interest rate thing is over. What does that mean? And, you know, there's been layoffs and rifts and all sorts of stuff all through. Um, and I think next year is hopefully when we'll sort of have the coming out of COVID moment of just like, great, okay, so this is the, you know, the new normal, the new, new, new normal. Um, and this is what we're really up to. Okay, thank you. Uh, similar to that theme, my prediction is that we may have the first AI bubble burst. Mm, okay. And so what I mean by that is we've had a lot of funding rounds for a lot of rapid AI startups and some of them are obscene Mm -hmm. and I'm not too sure they'll be able to justify further funding uh, next year as the models get more powerful and the open source models start having a lot of features and people start being able to build these things really easily. Um, And so I think a lot of these toy like prototype demos that got a lot of funding was going to struggle to get more funding. So maybe there's some version of an AI winter. I know, I'm not going to say it's across the board because I think AI funding will still increase or double or triple, but I think there's going to be certain categories where it just dries up completely. And it'll be interesting to see whether that happens next year or whether it's going to take a bit more time to play out. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Ludi, for joining um, for this section. And hope everyone listening likes our predictions if you've got any thoughts or comments you can put it in the text box on the spotify thing no one's done that yet um so you can be the first (laughs) james is just (laughs) desperate to get feedback via the spotify comment (laughs) box that probably goes nowhere no one maybe people have been putting comments in the whole time and we just haven't seen them because it just goes in a black hole i've been on other podcasts where they're very popular and still no one uses them so (laughs) maybe the feature doesn't work But uh, thanks, Lady, for joining us, and we will see you back on the podcast next year. Thanks, Thanks. Lady. On to our next section, and we have something really special for our Christmas podcast, which is. Shark GPT created cocktails that we are going to taste test live on our podcast. Isn't that exciting here? Very exciting. Nothing like being able to drink while also discussing technology companies. <laughs> That's correct. The favorite activity to do of everyone that works in tech. Now, to set the context, what I did is I went to ChatGPT and I asked it to pick out a couple of moments that were particular tumultuous. Tumultuous? Particularly tumultuous, yeah. It's tumultuous in tech history over this year. And the first one we got back was, of course, it's a little bit meta, OpenAI's ousting of Sam Altman. Okay, so tell us about about the cocktail, James. So, the cocktail is called the Sama. And I said, make a cocktail based on this. OpenAI said, sure thing. I'm going to make a cocktail, this is what it spat out, 
based on three areas. One, the power dynamics and shifts inside OpenAI uh, and the tensions of the power struggle uh, highlighted by the housing and subsequent reinstatement of CEO Sam Altman. Two, the technological and ethical considerations of the rapid development of AI of GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. And then three, the Microsoft's strategic maneuvering. So I thought GPT really summarized those aspects of the debacle really well. So oh. the cocktail will incorporate the following components, which is laid ingredients, laid ingredients and a twist of bitterness and a strong base of spirits, symbolizing the impactful nature of AI tech. How about that, huh? Great. <laughs> Um, and my favorite part of the cocktail ingredients is a dash of blue to represent Microsoft's significant role in the events. <laughs> there you go. So it sounds like, James, given yours is a layered cocktail, which is horribly complicated, perhaps I'll explain mine while you start preparing yours. Okay, uh, that sounds like a great idea. Mine, on the other end, uh, was uh, titled The Crypto Crunch, which is all about the uh, ousting, uh, not ousting, goodness, about the collapse uh, of FTX and Sam Bankman fried and obviously the... Uh, the, the ongoing uh, investigations and everything else. And obviously, yeah. uh, we covered a lot of that in the last uh, podcast um, and along with literally every single news outlet that exists. Yeah. Um, and so ChatGPT has created the Crypto Crunch. Uh, now, mine contains dark rum. I'm going to use uh, this rum, which was actually gifted to me by a colleague uh, from the Dominican Republic. So it's Dominican okay. Republic rum. Um, okay. It's my sort of homage to you know, uh, weird tax jurisdictions on small islands. Uh, that, of <laughs> That's course, a good you know, Works out how it goes to it. Um, according to ChatGPT, it represents the complexity and depth of the case. Um, I've got uh, ginger, ginger beer. I've got ginger ale, but close enough. Um, which is representing the fizz and buzz around the trial. Uh, I've got some limes for some lime juice uh, for a sharp twist with the unexpected developments of the trial. I've got bitters uh, for the bitter outcome for many involved. I think primarily Sam Bankman Freed, but you know other people probably didn't come out of it with their hands too clean. Uh, right. It calls for mint leaves, but I don't. I have mint leaves, so I have rosemary. The mint is meant to be a fresh start. I'm not sure who actually gets a fresh start, so I'm going to go with like a woody sharp thing, which is a rosemary bush, I guess, <laughs> uh, post trial. And uh, the recipe also called for a Bitcoin chocolate coin, uh, which of course I do not have. No. Uh, and, I thought that was a very know, odd addition from ChatGPT. It was a little bit clear. of a strange thing, but that was meant to be the nod to the crypto world. Um, so I'm going to start by muddling my uh, my rosemary with uh, with my so, so while lime you start juice, with that, I've got my let, small. Let me explain a little bit of what's going to happen with my one. So my one is a gin based cocktail, which I have now poured in the shaker, um, and that's meant to be the strong base of AI, apparently. Uh, then it's got lime juice to add a twist of bitterness, which is meant to represent the um, ousting of Sam, apparently. Um, and then I've got to add some lime juice, uh, as I mentioned, uh, blue cacao representing Microsoft and simple syrup to balance the flavors. I love that yours is quite advanced while mine is literally just like smash everything together in a cocktail shaker, add ice, and then serve, which is exactly the kind of level of complexity that I need. Well, it says that I smash it all together and then I meant to add a dash of grenadine, which I'm replacing with um, raspberry flavor syrup. <laughs> Great. Yes, Cotty's cordial. Because everyone was out of grenadine because apparently it's very popular I mean, at Christmas. I'm muddling with a small wooden lime juicer, <laughs> so, you know, I wouldn't say I necessarily got the... Uh, it turns out I don't have a muddler. That's a, you know, those are you oh, who wish well, to find my that, uh, Christmas gift. Perhaps a muddler oh, would be a good opportunity. I will um, consider getting you a muddler here for Christmas. How about it is that, quite huh? a nice rum, this rum, actually. Very nice rum. Well, feel free to Possibly add almost wasted on the, uh, on the cryptocurrency-themed cocktail, but, you know. The crypto crunch. The things I do for you, James. The things <laughs> I do. That's right. Uh, Rum and some bitters, okay? Yep, no, in, in, now the, the key is to obviously, as you must with bitters, always make sure you cover your light-coloured T-shirt uh, in it. Correct, that's right. So I've got lime going in. Okay, I've now added bitters all in. my main ingredients. Uh, um, fill the shaker with ice. Here we go. I've got, got my ice all ready. And so I'm going to shake. Yep, oh, nice shake close to the microphone just to wake everyone up. Got my glass here already as well. 
Oh yeah, I don't have a glass. Oh, no, I've got, got my glass. There we go. There we go. Oh, it's, oh, it's very orange. Quite orange. I've, I've, I, I don't know if it could be the bitters. The combination of the bitters and the dark rum probably ends up with the orange. And then I'm going to top it with some ginger beer. Look at this. My one's very, very blue. Look at that. Well, I mean, it's that's so that's what blue. happens with. It looks like Powerade, really. I does. Well, I should have tilted. I should have tilted my. I failed here in my cocktail making. I should have tilted my glass as I was pouring my ginger ale in. Just shows how I can't be trusted. Okay. Much like Sam Bankman Fried. Correct. Oh, Correct. now I've spilled. Now it's spilled everywhere all over my desk. Oh no. Just like oh, the no. assets of FTX investors being spilled <laughs> into, uh, you know, Almeida's re researchers' uh, balance sheet. That's right. It's, it's very frothy. I mean, this is what happens with bitters, though. Bitters does make drinks very frothy, I will say. Okay, just wait. Let me get this club soda. I'm going to quickly go. So it's a oh, I see you don't even have all the ingredients, James. <laughs> Unbelievable. The absolute challenges that we have to do here. They're poured perfectly with a bit of a meniscus. Oh, uh, the inverted that meniscus. Is perfect. So I've now got my club soda, uh, which I'm going to add a dash, apparently. And then... And then what I've got to do is add a dash of grenadine, which in this case is raspberry, to raspberry layer it. cordial. I can't believe you're drinking that. Oh, look. That's, I didn't have any grenadine. Yeah, now so are you that... layering it over a spoon, James? How is oh, your no, uh, cocktail making abilities? Because if you don't have oh, a spoon to layer it with, how will you be able to do it? This is a good point. I should really get a spoon. No, I don't really I'll have a... I've, 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 I've garnished with a small piece of uh, rosemary again. The woody, sticky, uh, you know, grows like a weed, much like FTX, the crypto exchange. It's my uh, my addition to the ChatGPT, and I'm going to give it a stir with a uh, with a knife that's been found on my desk. <laughs> Don't ask me why I have a knife on my desk. I'm making the garnish, which is an orange peel. Oh, your oh goodness! Are you going to express the orange? I am. I am. So, have you have you got a lighter to, to also this is, this burn is, it a little bit, James? No, I don't, unfortunately. So this is this is the garnish or the little the little. You meant to express twist. it over the cocktail, James. You just I, wasted the wonderful orange the, oils. I'm, I'm by no means a great cocktail maker, but that will be fine. So now I got to pour the grenadine in. So, goodness gracious, here we go. This is <laughs> how are you going to be able to try and do this? I mean, that's a that's a lot of lot a lot of liquid. I, I, I may have poured a little bit too much gin in this and soda I mean, water. There's a lot of soda water. I, I, of course, as a diligent cocktail maker, used a measure to ensure that I was measuring and uh, oh, I, keeping I used to the measure. recipe. I used to measure. I just may have accidentally done a double shot of gin, which is fine. Right. But let's see. So then the twist over the drink releases oils, then drop it in. Oh, I've got to drop it in so it's not meant to sit on my glass. There you go. Drop it in. And then I create the layer. So I'm going to pour the... Uh, Raz oh, look at that. Yeah, so you look did, at, you, you, that look that at, was the look worst at... layering I've ever seen. <laughs> Terrible bartender. Look at that descent in the board take over. <laughs> Cheers to, to, AI, to AI in 2023. Cheers. And to AI in 2024. I would say it smells heavily of rum. It's quite sweet. Mine's not sweet at all. I mean, yours has cordial in it, so that doesn't surprise me very much. <laughs> Americans would like this. It's very mine's, sweet. Mine's actually quite good. I mean, mine really just tastes like a rum with ginger ale, let's be honest, with a bit of bitters thrown in, which is not too bad a drink, to be fair. My one tastes like gin and cordial. <laughs> I'm not sure the rosemary adds a lot to mine, but I, I think mint would have been superior. Yeah, I think I can, I can, I mean, the mint sounds like it's going to be right. And I've got to say the grenadine would cut through a bit more. This, this, this raspberry cordial is like too it's sweet. It's a bit sweet, yeah. It's a bit sweet. However, the base of the gin and the blue cacao is actually pretty good. I didn't think they'd go too well. Um, so, okay. So, I mean, I rate, I rate this as, I rate this, like, I, I would buy this at a bar. Would I spend $40 on it? No, I wouldn't. And I definitely wouldn't spend $40 on the layering that you did there. But, you know, would I buy this for $16? Yeah, maybe. What about... 16 Australian about, dollars, to be clear. What about 16 Bitcoin? <laughs> that might be an expensive I joke. Mean, <laughs> if I own 16 Bitcoin, I'm not sure I'll be spending it on a ChatGPT themed <laughs> cocktail. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, I, I rank this three and a half out of five stars. Sounds good. 
What's your What's your out of five? Do you want I'll to give? Gi- a I'll give myself. Yeah, I'll give. I'll give myself a four. I'll give myself a four. I have, I rate my cocktail making skills quite low, so you know, it's a pretty low bar. Okay, sure. In that case, there we go. So the Sama um, and the Crypto Crunch uh, reviewed, and we're going to keep drinking this as we review our pitch deck, which leads us to our next section, which is roast my deck. For this deck, um, which was supplied to me today, actually, uh, so thank you very much for Michael. Uh, Hugh has not seen this. I've only flicked through it. Uh, As with all Roast My Decks, we have the mission of the founder, and the idea of Roast My Deck is obviously to give a live reaction of what VCs actually think about your deck and give the founder some feedback, which hopefully they'll find helpful as they raise money. Let's go. Um, Slide one, reality engine. The future is here sooner than we expected. Let the dream begin. Hugh, views. Look, what I don't like here is that it says let the dream begin and then the bottom right-hand corner says the dream is real. So is it beginning? Is it real? <laughs> Internally inconsistent. I did not actually pick that up, but that's This is not the crypto did. crunch speaking. This is me. <laughs> okay. I, I don't like it too much because I don't know what's happening, but sure. I think, uh, I think it could be a little bit more... A bit mysterious as to what the company is. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's go to slide two. Close your eyes. And I hate it. I hate it whenever they say close your eyes in a deck. I'm I mean, I, yeah, impossible instruction to follow while also still reading the deck. <laughs> Correct. Okay, maybe so this was a present deck. This is one of the yeah. Maybe this is a present deck. Okay, so we're imagining a phone. Next slide. Okay, open your eyes. All right, sure. I'll just sort of ignore that part. Uh, this, this image is, an... is image taken from directly from a six year old man's brain. The dream is real. Okay, so I think. So we're doing we're doing like the the neurovision thing, like a neurovision thing. A neur- yeah. Neural neural sorry neural vision. Neurovision, uh, yeah. So, okay, sure. I mean, the, okay. the man has imagined a 3310, which is probably about accurate. <laughs> That's extremely <extraordinary. That's> so true. <laughs> um, all right, slide four. Uh, okay, am I up for reading it? Yeah, okay, so there you go. Like, it is, this is a, uh, this is a, like, a neural reading thing. Is it a this new a product category? Reading. I don't know if it's a new product category. It's more just a product category no one's yet been able to unlock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, but, it's, you know... It, Interesting. I'm intrigued. Intrigued. Tell me more about the data. Tell me more about the science. How far okay, along so are you? Let's go to okay. size five. More images. Yeah. Okay. These look. These look like captures. These look like really terrible Google captures, or maybe the early the early GPT three you know uh, style, not GPT, but the early you know stable diffusion type uh, image generations is what these kind well, of that, look like. Well, I think this is directly taken from what I presume is this like. The, um, the cap. Um, I mean, that, that looks cap. like it's a file photo from the '80s, but you know. All I'd say is this is a, this is a very narrative style pitch, and and like for people that listen to our podcast, they know that we're in slide six, and we kind of are inferring what's happening here. Yeah. So, all right, slide six. Problem. Okay, so now we're in the problem. Now we're back in the problem again. Okay, so, I mean, everyone knows that it's a problem that computers can't read your mind. So, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what the problem is here because this is one of those new spaces where it's like the market doesn't really exist. Yeah, I mean... And as, I, as a I result, think, you think, know, it's hard to like say this is the problem of the market because there is no market. And so I think um, I think you need to kind of just ground it in like brain interfaces are going to unlock something. Yeah, correct. Like brain interfaces, big market. Like, but I think that's also... The, the challenge with this, I would say, is the right side doesn't really say to me... It, it talks about this as if we're building products but yeah. I would have thought that here we're building infrastructure. Like, you know, we're deep tech here, right? So, solution. Okay. Solution. Thoughtware. Mm. Is this mm. like shareware from the, from the late 90s, early 2000s? <laughs> um, synchronization of a... This, this feels a little bit like buzzword bingo at this point. It um, does. Again, I'm like the solution is here is muddling with product and with... Yeah, like what is this? Is this deep tech? Is this a product? Now it's like talking about consumer APIs. Like, what this is going to be consumed through through like a, a web interface? Like, yeah, I don't see how that's going to work because you yeah. need to wear a cap, I presume, to read your thoughts. Look, correct. I, I'd say, look, the, on the surface, it's very cool tech. If those images are for real, like that's really really fascinating. But I don't think it's some mysterious space. We know there's, uh, I mean, we know we as VCs know there's a lot of research in this space, and we've seen yeah. there's a, a lot of people are doing. Um, I think everyone can agree that imaging. whoever unlocks the ability to be able to have a some sort of neural interface between yeah. computers and your brain will make a lot of money. 
Correct. Like, yeah. Correct. So like, I'm going to jump to slide eight. Mark it. Okay. So now we're in data brokerage and competitive intelligence. Now this is now I'm really confused, right? Like. Yeah, I don't quite understand this. What? What? So now we're in data brokering and competitive intelligence. I'm not sure about how this relates back to the thoughtware sector, as they're calling it, but how does this relate back to neural brain interface type stuff? Not sure. I think the way it relates back is Quantium, which was owned by Woolworths, is going to read what you want when you walk into Woolies. (laughs) Sure. Okay. Could you imagine that? We're now transmitting our thoughts live (laughs) to be consumed by commercial entities. Just what I think society wants. Okay, slide nine. Is this, so is this now saying that it's a it's a market research firm slash project? I'm not too sure what it's saying, but I actually like the image here. So it shows me it's a cap. It shows me that it's reading various aspects it's got of science. it. Science. Yeah. Um, I don't understand why privacy has to be foundational to your design. Well, this, this is stage. where I think it's coming into that Experian Quantium Quantium stuff of like, is this like market research data aggregation? But again, like I'm like, well, but if it can read your mind and feed it into the computer like why you know is not the monetization of that fairly direct why does it need to be an indirect monetization into a third party that needs anonymous and aggra- aggregated data yeah i agree Maybe i'm a little bit confused us. yeah i'm confused 10 all right slide 10 thought to x api and soon platform so mm. okay so now we've got something something different it says the dreamscape yeah. is the equivalent of chat gpt for thoughts okay cool it streams data from any brain computer interface, BCI device, uh, to our cloud, allowing streaming of thoughts into internal monologue, inner monologue, images, music, and soon dreams. Now, confusing. Right? That is confusing. But the left side, the left side to me is like, okay, cool. You're describing, imagining a like brain computer interface. The right side yeah. is saying any brain interface is going to go into the cloud, and then as it like, conf- very confusing. It is confusing, and I think I think the problem I have with this is 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 the founders kind of introduced a few different use cases of this type of technology, and it's unclear to me which one he's tackling first. Yeah. And um, it feels like he's jumping to a product before he's worked out what the well, problem. I still, I still don't really know solved. what this is. Yeah. Well, I, I presume it's a software and hardware product. I don't know. Then it says any BCI device. All right. Let's go to slide eleven. Confusing is probably why I put Can that be- slide is. Now go, go to market. market. Okay, right, Whoa, we okay. Go. We're not talking about like you know technology TRL stages or anything like that. We're doing something else entirely different. Is it ready to go to market? Is my question. Yeah, I mean, first three first three months, we're going to go straight from you know brain data to an API. That's that's pretty. That's a lot. <laughs> given that I'm not sure we're getting any brain data in the first place. <laughs> Watch out, next 2024. Our predictions are wrong. It's going to be bullies reading our brain. I mean, I also worry a little bit about the expansion hiring piece says hire A players, and that's like late in the piece. I'm like, normally you raise to hire, right? So it's it, confused, again, confusing. And, and I just don't, I, I still don't really understand the problem. I don't understand how this is going to solve that. So yeah, confused. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to go to slide 12. Okay, cool. We've got a demo. We can do a demo. Okay, so how does it work? Okay, so now we've got an idea of what the product is. Okay, so it's taking EEGs. It's taking multimodal data with fuel movements Based. and it's got science and machine learning. And then a GPT-2 like model. Huh? I no, mean, I'm this just still really doesn't, this, is, this still doesn't really explain to me what this is. I thought this was the team slide from the little preview, but anyway, let's, let's uh, keep going and see if it, see if it works, us, works us out. Look, my, my feedback on this slide is it's introducing a bunch of new concepts that I should be introducing right now. And when you have a cap and then you're telling me you've got people and face detection, I'm getting really confused because I thought the cap was all you needed to... Yeah, uh, but the cap the might just be an EEG. And maybe they're just I'm pretty sure it is just an EEG. Yeah, correct. I'm pretty sure so it is. Next one. Uh, Ready to 15. go use cases. Okay, so like interesting question here of the first... Yeah, so this, the, the, the first bullet point here says to me market research, right? The first little bullet point yeah. here to me says first go to use case cinemas. You know, you can you can be able to record people's emotional responses to your film. And I'm like, okay, cool, you know. Second one is a gym. Oof. 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 <laughs> Oof. Oh, uh, gym. Gym's bad idea. Uh, the third one is uh, consumer testing, right? So this is like the piece of like how does, you know, Nielsen and people like that uh, and the market research agencies test if you like the flavor of chocolate. 
I mean, yeah. sure. What's your feedback on this slide? Do you, I mean, I, I just find it a little bit unclear here. I, I mean, I, I think if this is what the business is today, then it's like we're building the next generation of market research tools. I'm like, cool, yeah. okay, okay, cool. You know, like market research, big, big industry. We've got to do it, you know. But like, yeah. it doesn't really, this doesn't say any brain computer interfaces, you know, everything else. Slide 14. <laughs> I mean, this is just saying cool people find this problem interesting. I think this is very confusing. Um, I just don't understand what this is. Okay, on we go. Uh, and then he's got, so then I'm just going to jump through here. So there's only a couple of slides here. So he's got right. this other people's patents. Yeah, other people's patents are confusing. And then we finally get to a team slide, which is here. Okay, just one person. Again, more context needed. We've spoken about sort of the solo co founder problem, the solo founder problem before. And what's yeah. our final slide? And then the ask. Okay, the ask is one to two million. Okay, sure. So I think just my net of this is just very confusing deck. I don't understand the whole thing. It makes no sense to me. Um, yeah. Send this okay. one back to the keyboard. Probably, I would say, feedback to the founder is, take this deck to more people that don't know what you're doing and haven't spoken to you and don't know anything about your space and say, hey, this needs to explain what I'm doing. Can you read it and tell me if it makes sense? So I think it's a piece yeah. of probably, it's a deck that's been produced from too many people who already understand the business and the problem and everything else but hasn't had enough feedback from people that are totally unaware of the founder and what he's doing and stuff like that. You know, find the random family friend and just say, hey, like, I just need your feedback on this to see what you think. I agree. I agree. Good feedback. Too All much right. looking within the own world. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It needs to get some more feedback. And I think, I think that's, that's, that's right. And we're very happy to review the A, a, a good stage. example of a very early deck, though. Like, pre yeah. the many iterations that we do with our own founders, um, a very classic example of the first version of a deck or one of the early versions of a deck, I guess. Um, you know, a very clear example and that piece of like confusing messages and everything else, every founder goes through that phase when they're building these decks and that's where it's really important to get that feedback from people who you don't talk to about work all the time um, to be able to really, you know, sort of shape that perspective and make sure that it comes through clearly for people that don't actually, you know, live in your, in your head. Mm. Correct, correct. All right. Thank you very much, Hugh, for that. And I agree with those points. Thank you, Michael, who shared the deck, who's the founder of that business as well. We'll be happily to take a look at your next version. And thanks, ChatGPT, for the cocktails. Um, and importantly, thanks to our listeners for listening. This is our sixth episode, so we're pretty new. We want your support. So we want to keep doing the podcast in 2024. We are looking for small sponsors, not very big ones, who this want to sponsor us into next year. Yeah, surprise. Um, if you would... Just send me an email. It's just team at galileo.ventures. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with a founder or investor who think you would benefit from it today. And finally, please subscribe. Spotify, Apple, yeah. or YouTube, and give us don't a Don't forget to like and subscribe, as the youth say. I don't know if you can like Correct. on Spotify, but you can on YouTube, right? So smash that like button, hit subscribe. You can heart, you can heart on us. That's a like, isn't it? Yeah, it's a like. Oh, you can heart on Spotify too. Yeah, okay, there you go. Yeah. Um, otherwise, everyone, have a great Christmas and year, and thanks for listening. Awesome. We'll see you all on the other side. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>